We have a fine and dandy episode this week. We are joined by our uh, our climate, I don't want to say oracle, that puts way too much pressure on this. I'm going to say, uh, boy, and consultant just seems corporate, uh, but, but David Wallace-Wells, has been studying this issue of, of climate change f- for a long, long time. The, the main thing is published The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming in 2019, which uh, r- really looked at the scope and, and speed of climate change. Uh, and, and I guess right now, David, you're, are, where are you working now? N- new York Magazine? Still in New York, yeah. I wanted to, to bring you on to talk about our climate episode. The discussions that we had with David were, were, were basically centered around this idea. As I listened to the conversation, I felt like it wasn't an honest one that that people aren't being told that the time horizon that we've been put on doesn't square with the actions that we're taking. And I wanted to get your opinion on that as kind of a, a central core of how we talk about climate, that we're not really having an honest conversation. I think on one side, there's a sense that, oh, these technologies exist. We could all go solar tomorrow. Everything would be fine. And on, you know, a different side, it's oil will be with us until forever. I think most people looking at this in a concerned but perhaps superficial way think we're moving in the right direction finally. You know, we've been hearing about climate change for a long time. Not much has happened, but over the last couple of years, we're really starting to see a lot more progress on wind and solar. People are buying electric cars. You know, we see politicians making these dramatic pledges at climate conferences, and that's all true. The world is turning. Mm -hmm. It is starting to take this seriously. But just moving in the right direction here is not enough because we've really just run out of time. You know, if we had started in 1992 with a big Rio conference when the UN declared, you know, we don't want to, we want to avoid dangerous warming, we would have had like 125 to 150 years to decarbonize to avoid dangerous warming. At, at what at what level, like what percentage when you say decarbonize, like w- we would have had to wean ourselves off at like a 1%, 2% reduction a year to get to this yeah. net zero goal? I see. Okay. In the, at that level. I mean, really at the margins. And it's a little more complicated because in the developing world, especially 30 years ago, they were people didn't have electricity. And, you know, it's not just a matter of, you know, the US and, and the UK sort of reducing their carbon. But at the big picture, like it was a, it was a pretty manageable task. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it required some technology we didn't have, but like the, the scale of change was relatively small. And now we're at a point where to, you know, to get to that same point where we have kept global temperatures below 1.5 degrees, which is what the scientists talk about. Right. Will, rem- will mean that we have to get all the way to zero in under 30 years from a much higher peak than we were at 30 years ago. And that means just really, really dramatic changes to almost every feature of our lives, which is one reason I think it's not all that likely. And we should also be talking about what we can do to make life past that level of warming relatively more livable. I think a lot of people think about, you know, fossil fuels, cars, et cetera. We got to decarbonize that stuff, but it's not the whole picture. So if we're waiting 30 or 40 years to decarbonize those parts of the economy, and we got to turn to agriculture and infrastructure, jet fuel, um, all these other things that are even trickier. And, you know, to really give us, give ourselves a meaningful chance of hitting that 1.5 degree target by 2050. And we're just nowhere near, as as much progress is being made, as happy as I am that like the world is starting to take seriously, we're just moving nowhere near the speed that would be necessary to allow us to land below 1.5. And on the flip side of that, all the politicians who talk about Biden and Obama, even the, the, the two presidents in the United States who really probably took it more seriously than anybody, still come home from climate conferences and brag about opening up the petroleum reserves. Or, you know, there was a, a, there's a great clip of President Obama at a conference going like, hey man, I was the guy who increased our oil production. That was me. Like, bragging about it. Yeah, he says, say thank you. It makes you wonder, well, do they actually believe this? Is this a, are they being cynical? I think the short answer is yes. (laughs) All right, we're done here. That's it. We're getting out. That shouldn't surprise us. I mean, that's politics, right? And politics is complicated and climate politics is complicated. Energy politics is complicated. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not like 
if we just had the right people in charge in 1992, we could have snapped our fingers and made the world a very comfortable, happy, rich, prosperous, just, beautiful, perfect place without any disruptions to anybody. Like, there is a reason we're in the bind we're in. Right. And that is because for several centuries, fossil fuels have been incredibly cheap, abundant energy, which has powered literally the entire history of economic growth. We didn't have economic growth before fossil fuels. Right. But that can't be an excuse for continuing mm -hmm. to operate in this way, given that we are already today at just like 1.1, 1.2 degrees of warming, we're outside the window of temperatures that enclose all of human history. So the entire history of human civilization is the result of climate conditions we've already left behind. When you think about, you have to separate it to human history. It's, it's sort of like they say, oh, we've got to save the earth. And I always feel like, well, the earth will be fine. I mean, the yeah. earth was, was covered in lava. Like to the earth, people are just like chiggers. Like it's not, it's just a, a mild irritation. Like we're the ones that'll be leaving. So when you say that we're beyond the scope of, of temperatures that we've ever experienced, that's, that's not the earth. That's just the earth as it's been habitable to humans. Yeah, and, and um, everything we ever know is the result of those climate conditions. So, you know, we're an adaptable species. We're resilient. We'll be able to figure out we're living now at 1.2 degrees. We've never lived at that level before. We'll be able to figure out higher levels too. But it'll require dealing with much more suffering, much more disarray, um, right. You know, much more catastrophe, especially um, and especially given like what you and I were sort of raised to expect about the future, that it would be more comfortable, more prosperous, more just, more equal, et cetera. Um, you know, climate change at the very least complicates those promises and may, if things get really out of hand, um, totally withdraw them, which would be a really ugly and unfortunate future you're saying no jetpacks because <laughs> i've been i've been promised for a very long time since the jetsons that we would have flying cars and personal jetpacks you're saying this is going to be delayed now at least six months to 20 years you haven't gotten your jetpack yet i do <laughs> not have my jetpack yet the other part of this that's so difficult is i mean the united states has put out more of these greenhouse gases, I think, than what? The rest of the world combined? Is that the, you know, and as Not a, quite, but they're by far the biggest big. share, yeah. By far the biggest share. And now you've got all these sort of, these countries that were pre-industrial that are now industrializing and, and look at the standard of living that free and cheap petroleum has brought to them. How can you expect any of these countries to abide that in any manner? Yeah, it's a hard bargain to <laughs> to strike. I would say two things though. The first is yeah. underlying your underlining your point. Like the US is the most responsible party here. And over the course of history, carbon emissions are really closely correlated with wealth, which means basically anybody who's rich anywhere in the world, and especially in any country that's rich anywhere in the world, is doing a really disproportionate um, damage to the to the climate. And important to keep in mind. You know, it's not just like carbon doesn't go into the air and dissipate. It hangs up there for centuries, which means that what made America an industrial titan in the late 19th, early 20th century, that fossil fuel damage is still heating the planet. And its heating power is equivalent to the damage that's being done by China today. So the fact that China is doing it today doesn't make it worse than the stuff that we did, you know, generations ago. And we're standing on those generations, you know, wealthier, ah. wealthier as a result. And I think that Americans and Westerners in general really should reckon with that set of facts that we are wealthy today because we poisoned the well for future generations already. We may have more progressive climate policies today to some degree, depending on the country, than some of these right. um, countries in the developing world, but it doesn't matter. We are still deeply, deeply guilty. On the positive side, that bargain that you talked about right. is really different now because renewable energy is so much cheaper than it used to be, even five years ago, which means... If you're a country in Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia, and you're making a 10 or a 20 or a 30 year plan for your country's energy future, right. it doesn't make economic sense to try to subsidize the fossil fuel business and consume um, dirty energy the way that we have for the mm -hmm. last century and a half. It actually is much cheaper. The energy is more abundant, will lead to more prosperity if they take a much more you know, renewable focused approach. And that is mm -hmm. really new. You know, There's some studies showing 80, 90% of the right. world now lives in places where new renewable energy is cheaper than um, dirty energy. And in some places, it's even easier to build new renewable capacity, to build whole new solar plants, whole new wind farms, than just continuing to run your old fossil fuel energy. So we are in a place now where like, we don't have to ask poor people in poor countries to forego 
the wealth that we've had, we can help them make a faster transition, not to just a cleaner future, but actually a more prosperous future and not have to make that trade-off at all. Who's going to win that race, David? Because these fossil fuel companies are, because they were the engine of, of progress, they've certainly, the legacy profits in that business. Because I thought it was really interesting, the thing you said about the greenhouse gases that we've put up already, we're feeling the effects of now, which almost makes it seem like, it's like the light from the stars. The light, the light you're seeing now is not light that's happening now. It's light that has traveled. So you're, you're really almost looking into the past, right? But the power players in all this are still the legacy industries of our progress. And I, I don't want to demonize them because I do believe in the, it, this is a byproduct of our success, not the design of it. It wasn't designed to destroy the world. It was designed for progress. The byproduct of it, pollution and, and, and those types of things, we haven't mitigated as well as we could have. But I think it's too easy to point the finger and say, you motherfuckers poisoned this place. Like, we have a role in this. People enjoy the the, the success that, that we've had as a species. And it's going to be really difficult to change that. But in these emerging markets the leaders in that development are still kind of oil companies and petroleum companies because there's such energy, you know, Africa and those areas are so energy rich from those uh, extraction models. Well, they're, and they're actually richer um, on a renewable model. What the? It, it happens to be the case that um, poor countries are relatively speaking more, have more abundant solar power than richer countries. Um, now they're complicated set of reasons for that, which have to do with, you know, there's some, ge there's some geographic determinism, there's some colonialism, et cetera. But um, if you're thinking about like, should like Chad um, spend money on fossil fuel development and extraction, or should Chad invest in solar, taking the global perspective, they're actually better off in a solar dominated energy world than one in which one that's dominated by fossil fuels. There are a lot of complications that those governments face having to do with committed resources their lack of um, capital to invest in somewhat capital intensive infrastructure projects right. that this would require. Right. And they also are to a certain degree dependent on um, tax revenue from these existing businesses. You know, many of them get a large share of their national tax revenue from the fossil fuel business. So for all of these reasons, they are kind of incentivized to stick with the status quo and keep burning fossil fuels, um, which is not just gonna harm the climate future of the planet, but also the, the health of their citizens because they're huge I'm in some ways even more catastrophic than climate effects, huge effects and on health public effects. health. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, if you're designing this from a whiteboard and saying like, all right, let's start from scratch today, 2022, what are we going to, what is sub-Saharan African energy going to look like? And weren't dealing with all of those legacy problems and complexities. I think it's pretty inarguable that like every person looking at that, um, looking at that set of dilemmas and those set of um, challenges and, and dynamics would say the best path here is for an aggressive push into renewable energy. So the question is, you know, what can what can we do in the global north, and what can those um, leaders in the global south do right. to like make the whiteboard logic work in the real world, as opposed to just being like a fancy happy thing to talk about in universities and um, on, right. on Zoom calls, you know? Because that's the thing is is we have to look at it from the real world perspective, and and you have to think to yourself like, well, so where is the money coming from for this development? And generally, it's coming from people that are looking to exploit these resources. You know, when you're looking at countries that are historically have been exploited, this is just another model to continue that process. So the people that came in and extracted the mineral wealth and the labor wealth uh, and, and, and all kinds of other areas of wealth in sub-Saharan Africa and all these other areas are now in there extracting energy wealth under the guise of, Hey man, we're going to help you develop. We're going to help you build some shit. So here's how it's going to go. We're going to mine it. We're going to extract it. We're going to do all those things. And in exchange, we will build you these infrastructure models. So if, if, cause I do understand what you're saying about, well, if, if you look at it, it's actually, uh, they're wealthier in sunlight or, or, or those types of things. But the truth is, 
I think the, the people that are going to provide the engine of that development are still looking at a legacy model of exploitation, it seems. And that's, that's the one that is, I don't know how you break that. I think in part, it's trying to build an incentive structure so that um, new build out of renewables um, is not dependent on large immediate profits because the profit margins on um, in the renewable sectors is smaller than no the profit question. margin. Um, and in part, that's because it's actually a lot easier to do. You don't have to take these risks. <laughs> you know, like right. do, doing, a, doing oil exploration is like hugely capital. You don't have to find the sun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it does mean that like these companies are not going to just say like, oh, well, uh, energy is cheaper, therefore we should do it. They're the ones who want <laughs> the price of energy to be pretty high, um, at least compared to the price of extraction. So right. what that means is like we need a different kind of um, a kickstart here. It's still a profitable business. It still can be a, you know, um, a sustainable, like rewarding business, but it's not the bonanza globe straddling, you know, we're going to transform all of geopolitics for a century and a half kind of business that, um, that oil and gas was. Um, and that means that probably we need considerably more support from, um, from the public sector to make that happen. Right. And unfortunately, in the parts of the world that we're talking about, those um, governments just don't have the resources that we do in the global north. So there has been this, you know, um, growing call for support from the nations of the global north to the nations of the global south to sort of um, kickstart this transition um, for the last decade or two. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, the rich countries of the world have pledged some nominal amount of support and then failed to deliver it and then pledged what? again. Wait, yeah. <laughs> no, that, hold on a second. So you're, tell, you're telling me, David Wellswell, you're telling me that uh, the rich countries of the world have said they were going to do something to help uh, the countries that they had uh, traditionally exploited and yet not delivered on that promise. Yeah. So in the Paris Accords, I think they actually initially made a pledge of $100 billion a year in 2009, but they sort of more formally made it in Paris right. in 2015. They, they, um, that that um, deal was like finally struck in 2016. Um, and they have still not lived up to that promise. They've gotten close to $100 billion, but only if you count all of these um, interest gaining loans, which are basically money making anyway. Right. In the meantime, the countries of the global south have upped their ask, yeah. now looking at what they need to do, not just in terms of how quickly they need to transition, but also the um, impacts of climate change on their livelihoods and how much they need to do to adapt to the future that is being created by all these um, additional emissions. And they're like, we need, we don't need 100 billion a year, we need 700 billion, we need 800 billion. They've been, at the Glasgow conference last fall, they were asked of 1.2 and 1.3 trillion, 1.3 trillion. So we're talking about right. a much, much higher ask. And the countries of the West, the global North, have basically been like, okay, this time we promise we'll give you 100 billion dollars a year. Which is, you know, I don't, you know, hundred billion dollars is not uh, nothing, but um, it is, you no, know, but it, on the scale of the yeah. global economy with all these countries, it is chump change. Yeah, even one point three trillion on the global scale of economies to kickstart uh, a renewable future for pre-industrial or or just moving into in the industrial age, like that's fucking chump change yeah. for these dudes. We're spending that on wars per year. And in theory, just from a naked self-interest calculus, like these investments would pay us back because these countries would be much healthier and more productive as a result. And they are our business partners. And I don't think we need to think narrowly in those terms, but you don't have to be um, a moralist to think that we should be doing this. Like if the right. world is, you know. There's an efficiency argument. And a, and a profit argument. I mean, if in India, right. like, you know, the average person in Delhi, their life expectancy is nine years shorter because of air pollution. Um, you know, there are estimates that their GDP is 6% lower because of air, just air pollution, putting aside the natural disasters and all the rest of the climate impacts. If you're talking about an India that is 6% richer every year, that's, that's a lot of additional wealth that the rest of the world could be sort of involved in, in a, um, in a gross capitalistic sense. Like, I mean, there are a lot of other arguments for doing this too, but I think what's really striking to me in thinking about it in 2022 is like, Philosophers use the term overdetermined. Like there are so many different arguments you can apply to say we should be doing this much faster. Mm -hmm. Almost every single one of them makes the case on its own, but we've got like six of them. Um, and yet we're not doing it because- Well, that, so now yeah. we beg the question. So this gets to kind of the, the, the crux of the whole idea, which is traditionally uh, the, the climate argument has relied on this idea that if people would only use this light bulb, if you would only- get this toilet flow, it, it got placed on that idea of 
it was climate change would be stopped by personal virtue of those that had already experienced the post-industrial gains. A, what we found out is that was kind of a ruse created by the oil companies to kind of get you to look in a different direction rather than focusing on, you know, the 70% of greenhouse gases that come from a uh, hundred different petroleum companies or energy companies. They wanted you to look at the individuals so that you they were going to make it about personal responsibility. Hey man, if you were just a better fucking person, we wouldn't be in this situation and, and you better get your shit together. Clearly, that's not the way out of this. It, it's a much larger uh, issue. And, and what it said to me was, and it got me thinking that those that created this issue, the, the energy extraction industries, we have to create a profit model for them that is at least within the same universe as the profit model they've experienced now if we expect them to help transition us into this much safer economy for the world appropriately. And that's where I got to, and I was, it, it, it's what I was trying to get to with the guy from Shell. How much do we have to pay you? How, what is it gonna take for me to put you in a greener economy today? Like, what do we have to pay them to clean this shit up? And is it, is carbon sequestration and carbon capture maybe the answer here? I, I'm not saying that you don't have to do these other things, but clearly we're not doing that on the time horizon that we need to. And is the answer, I hate, I mean, to put it in these terms, bribing these people to change their business model, to give them a business model that is effectively moving us towards a safer environment. Well, I'm going to ask that, but let me just say first at the top. Back it up. Back you, it up, David. <laughs> Give us a macro. You put it. You put a couple assumptions in there, which may or may not yes. be true, but if we want them to be a part of the transition. Yes. We did not ask Philip Morris to be part of the transition. From a practical perspective, we have in the past retired industries that we understood to be destructive to our future. Um, and we have done that in certain cases with like, you know, getting those people on board and, you know, buying them out or whatever. Um, many people on the climate left um, under appreciate how much more wealth and prosperity and as a result, to some degree, equality and justice there is, especially in the developed parts of the world, as a result of economic growth that's been powered by fossil fuels. Although at this point in right. time, it is now no longer necessary for us to continue on that path, to continue, you know, using fossil fuels. We can count on not just further prosperity, but additional prosperity um, through the use of renewables. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. So we are now at a point where a lot of that calculus has, has really shifted. The truth is that um, we are not going to get where we want to go just through decarbonizing. In fact, we won't even get there if we decarbonize as fast as the scientists tell us that we should. All of these scenarios right. that allow us to keep warming to 1.5 degrees um, they require an absolutely like, you know, I think some people have called it like a black diamond kind of run down the slope of carbon emissions, cutting it to zero with, with unbelievably rapid right. speed. But in addition to all that, in addition to that World yes. War II scale global mobilization, we also need to yeah. be taking carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it somehow in a permanent way because everything that we've put up there is still up there heating the planet. And if we want to- Even if we change, even, even if we were to do it at the speed and, and decarbonize our economy- at the speed by which you would keep it at 1.5 degrees, there's still all of this that exists in the atmosphere that if we don't take it out, we still get fucked. Yeah, and the scale of that is just, I mean, unbelievably staggering. It's a little complicated even to wrap your head around. It's like 2,500 billion tons of carbon are in the atmosphere. 2,500 billion tons. Like, a car is like one ton. <laughs> We're talking about... 2500 billion wait you mean you mean the literal weight of it the Are weight of the gas the... up there <laughs> yeah really yeah so we need to like get a lot of that out put it back underground so it stops heating the planet and like i said even the most optimistic decarbonization scenarios still ask for a really significant build out of what this variety of techniques Broadly, we call it negative emissions, and there are different tools, some of which are technological, some of which are more quote-unquote natural. 
But in these IPCC scenarios that allow us to stay below 1.5 degrees, they expect in addition to this World War II scale mobilization starting 2019, which we didn't do, <laughs> we need a negative emissions business that is um, at least twice as big as today's oil and gas business by the year 2050. They, they say we need to build one of these negative emissions plants every day between now and 2050. And today we have one operational in the entire world. But that's my point. So who's got the infrastructure to do that and who's got the incentive to do that transition? So they're so resistant, right? And by slow rolling it, I'm not saying they're the sole driver of our inability to get to this net zero, because the truth of the matter is, I believe human nature is, I have something that I need to plug in. Where the fuck is the plug? They don't care if it comes from solar, wind, oil, anything. They just want to plug it in. You know, there, there's so many complications to switching to this. And I think human nature is one of generally like once you've discovered the microwave. You're never going to cook. Why would you cook? If it's going to take me longer than a minute to make a potato, I'm like, what What sort of primitive world are we living in? Yeah. It's, it's just not happening. So it it feels like we're sort of in this really terrible bind. The transition is not happening fast enough. The reality of the conversation we should be having about climate feels like how do we mitigate the catastrophic effects for the most vulnerable people in the world, the people who least contributed to this problem are the ones who are going to feel the catastrophic effects of it the most deeply are already and are already feeling it just like you said in terms of air pollution and life expectancy but how do we really realistically mitigate this catastrophe that's going to come down on 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 all of our heads but most certainly on the heads of the most vulnerable you know there are different ways of looking at this there are political frames there are technological frames right um the, the moral framing is um, people like you and me and our ancestors um, have done an awful lot of damage. Some of it is being apportioned to us and our descendants, but a lot of it is being apportioned to people in especially sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia who've done so much less. And just to put that in perspective, all of sub-Saharan Africa, we're talking about 800 million people, they have in total contributed about 1% of all historical global greenhouse gas emissions. Oh, and in the U.S., one country, we've done about 20, a little over 20%. And I think we really, really don't think in those terms when we talk about these um, challenges enough. Um, because it's not only that it's like these people who didn't do anything um, to contribute who are suffering. It's also that they are so much closer to, you know, basic subsistence level risks that like right. a, a minor setback of an unusual or even unprecedented heat wave or a single natural disaster just pushes them way, way deeper into the shit than we experience in our parts of the world. So like you saw the Pacific heat dome in the in you know uh, Western Canada in the U.S. last year, a few thousand people died. That's really bad. But if a similar like off the charts heat wave that much out of the historical norm hit a place that mm -hmm. had no air conditioning. <laughs> Um, where people were, did not have a functioning local government or, you know, cooling centers in their town. Like, you'd be talking about much, much, much bigger impacts. And we are likely to see those kinds of heat waves going forward. That's not to say everybody in sub-Saharan Africa is going to die in the next 30 years. But, like, the number of people whose lives are degraded and ended so, uh, too soon by climate effects is going to grow really dramatically. And probably, even though those effects are going to be seen in our parts of the world too, we'll sort of comfort ourselves by saying, oh, well, at least we're not living in, you know, Chad. Um, at least we're not living in India. Can't you c convince people that like, they won't be living there either. Like peop humans travel, like this is gonna cause a migration crisis. I mean, l look at what happened when we destabilized the Middle East. I don't know if you remember that. It was a few years back, about 15, 20 years back. We destabilized them. It depends when you want to talk. You could go much farther back to say, yeah. Can I just tell you this? It's the fucking British. It's always been, it always comes down to them. These, they just drew a map that made no sense. But, but the, the point being that destabilization and the cascade effect of human misery that leads people in desperation, look, the Southern border crisis is, is a similar crisis uh, in, in this country, 
uh, the European uh, crisis. It's a people that in desperation move towards an area that is more prosperous and more stable. And then that area has to get into resource guarding and uh, a, a battle against the other. And we're going to find ourselves in a, a world of with, with a real recipe for destabilization and violence that I think we haven't seen a, a scale of yet. So taking it out of the moral argument, can you make the the argument about the selfish argument for people. This is this isn't about being moral for other people. This is about selfishly guarding the stability in your own life. Both arguments are true, um, you know, and I think you're absolutely right to talk about migration as a real disruptive force that will be accelerated or enlarged by um, climate impacts. We saw a similar pattern in. Syria, where they had a civil war, which wasn't just a climate cause civil war, mm -hmm. but climate contributed to it. And as a result, one million people went from Syria into Europe. And the whole European migration crisis, the whole, all you know, the global populist moment to some degree was sort of triggered by that migration right. from Syria of one million people. Now, the UN says by 2050, thanks to climate change, we're going to have um, 200 million climate migrants. And they actually How say the number could be as high as one billion. Wow. I mean, which is as many people as live today in right. North and South America combined. Now, I actually think that, that those numbers are a little misleading and a little alarmist. I think, first of all, most migration happens within country rather than from country to country. And second of all, I just I just think those numbers are a little high. I, I, I would. But even if we're talking about let's take their lower bound estimate, right. 200 million divided in half. That's still 100 times the scale of the impact of the Syrian refugee and migration pattern that so disrupted European politics. So. It's very clear that, like, unless we, to some degree, redesign our migration politics, we're in for some real deep disruption. And there is some social science that suggests that there's most resistance to new arrivals when those numbers are pretty small, and that once they get to a certain level, there's a greater level of acceptance. Although you could point to the example, the historical example of the U.S. and say, you know, we are a nation of migrants, and yet we are still quite hostile to new arrivals. Oh, that's that's the key to our existence. I always said this, my grandfather got here, you know, from, he, he came from China, got got off the boat and then turned around to the people behind him in line and said, get off my land. Like that's that's who we are. Like it's, once you gain an ownership, it's, it's resource guarding and it's territorial. And I think that the thing that's most frustrating to me is how unrealistic the conversation around climate really is and and versus the reality of what we're actually uh, up against activists have done an amazing job of raising that awareness but they're also the most easily dismissed because you know that's everybody can just say, oh those they're hypocrites and they've got you've got a air conditioner so fuck you it's not about personal virtue it's about these societal and cultural and industrial shifts. But the thing that's most frightening is, even when I hear you talk about it and when I talk to Ben Van Buren about it, it's always in the, we should, we will. We, it's always in future tense. After all this time and all this disruption, it still feels like we're just talking about what we should do. Well, I think that activists have their role. Their role is not to run the world. <laughs> their role is to shape public right. opinion. And they have they have done that actually really remarkably well. And I think that we are in a new position of climate opportunity with some reason for limited mm -hmm. hope, in part because of the power of that activism over the last few years. I think it's really incredible, actually, because for like 40 years, we had climate activists and environmental activists who didn't achieve any progress. And now we're in a place where the shouting has really changed the way at least the politicians talk to some degree, how they spend their money, and at least certainly the way that um, CEOs talk, although not yet really how, how they spend their money. You know, that's that's um, that's a limited impact. We need more. We need a society-wide transformation, um, which with almost every aspect of our lives um, changed. And that is a really big ask. You're absolutely right. We're not moving nearly fast enough that, you know, when they started talking about climate change in conferences in the late 1980s, they talked about avoiding dangerous climate change. That's gone. Then they talked about avoiding catastrophic climate change, which they defined as below two degrees. 
we're not yet gone on that, but like it's pretty close. Um, and beyond that, we have to start talking about adapting to and responding to and figuring out ways to live in a world that is defined by forces, which not eight centuries ago, but like eight years ago, we defined as unacceptable. Mm -hmm. That's how fast we're moving into the disaster area. Now, again, that's not to say that there won't be any happy, prosperous human life on the planet at 2.2 degrees, but it does mean that we will be besieged by climate impacts and navigating a world defined by climate in a way that is almost unthinkable even to you and me today in 2022, because we anchor so much of our expectation of the future in our experience of the present. And the present, there are problems, there are climate problems, but it's like not disarray. Now, what that demands of us and what we can expect and what kind of transformation we can hope for, it's a really, really complicated question, which has a lot of inputs. You, you know, you've talked about, about the, the level of the individual, the person gets benefits from, you know, um, from cheap fossil fuels. They don't want change. They're reluctant to pay more at the pump, but also just change. Mm -hmm. Like, even if they're not paying more, people just, they like the status quo. They don't like the new thing. Um, you know, politicians have moved too slowly. The, the oil companies certainly have been engaged in disinformation and, and denial campaigns, which have slowed things down. And yet we are now in a place in part because the renewable revolution has been so successful, movement is really different. And it means in theory, at least, that we could be moving, um, you know, maybe mm -hmm. not as aggressively as the scientists like. There are too many obstacles, just practical obstacles in the way of that. But much more fa much faster than most activists thought was um, believable. But the landscape looks so different than it did all that not all that long ago. And right. as a result, I think... You know, it's easy to be dispirited. I'm dispirited sometimes, too, about yes. how little has been done over 30 years. On the other hand, you know, the next 30 years, maybe I'm sounding naive, maybe I'm being naive, but it seems like it's a, it's a whole different ballgame um, that we're playing So let's now. play that out, because I think th th that's an interesting exercise, because I always try and, you know, there's a theoretical process to this, and then there's a human behavior in the real world process of this. I, I can tell you how I think this is going to play out. And I would like to hear how you, do you want to hear me to go first or you want to go first? You go first, please. Here's how I think this plays out. You have laid out a thorough, very complex and nuanced uh, view of industry and political leaders working together on a global scale to recreate uh, an energy positive future that is uh, more efficient, uh, less damaging and uh, one in which we are still moving forward in a productive way with the industrialization and progress that humans have become accustomed to. And we're going to spread that into other areas and it may not be fast enough, but it's, it's the way we're moving forward in the future. I try and look at it as you think that's naive, John, Boy, here we go. <laughs> Cause look, man, the process that you laid out about cooperation is hard for me to stomach when like I see videos from Trader Joe's every day of people flipping the fuck out just because they have to wear a mask for the three minutes that they're in there buying a bacon and chive dip. Like, so it's hard for me to imagine. And that's Trader Joe's. And that's Trader Joe's. <laughs> for some reason, all these videos are always at Trader Joe's, but so the complexity that you talk about of what has to go right is so is so complex that I can't imagine, and that's with co human cooperation, and it's so hard for me to imagine that, that what I imagine is cataclysmic events being reacted to in short-term geoengineering measures, and it feels like that's going to be how we play this out over the next 30 to 50 years. And you tell me if that's too cynical. Well, what I would start with is by saying, I actually think that one of the major implications of the new um, renewable economics is that we don't need cooperation. Okay. Because every country planning its energy future understands that their um, energy future will be better if they move faster. And that is a really liberating fact. It means that we are not depending on the better angels of our nature, mm -hmm. we're not depending on cooperation. Okay. Um, that's not to say that climate disaster won't increase our collective sense of the sort of zero sumness of the world mm -hmm. and make us feel like we do need to hoard 
and we do need to close our borders and we do need to look out for number one and not to look out for, you know, the the poor, sad, starving baby in sub-Saharan Africa whose face we've ignored on late night infomercials anyway for 30 years. Um, those dynamics are real. And it's one of the one of the sort of storylines I'm most worried about going forward, that we we stop seeing um, the world as a positive sum place, um, right. even in those parts of the world that have benefited most from a positive sum view of, um, of progress and mm-hmm. start to see it much more the way that we saw in a sort of early modern um, phase of the world when it was like... A more feudal system, maybe not Mad Max, but a more feudal system. Yeah, and you know, especially as that ties into immigration, it's really, it's really scary. You know, I my guess in terms of where we head in the next few decades is that we move a lot more quickly than seemed possible five or 10 years ago to build out our renewables. We don't move as quickly as we can to retire our fossil fuel capacity, which is really the problem. We could like have 50 times as much renewable as we have today, but if we're still using the same oil and gas, it doesn't matter. Right. And we end up, you know, at a level of warming, say in, in, at 2050, that is well beyond what was defined as um, our goals not that long ago, say somewhere between two and three degrees. What happens then, you mentioned geoengineering. I think that that's possible. Um, right. And you know, there is, I think, about to be a wave of new research and debate about it. Um, but actually, I think the argument for geoengineering is relatively weaker than it was five years ago because a lot of the worst case scenarios seem much less likely because of the progress that we're making now. So that means... If we're talking about, like, if the world is fundamentally at three degrees of warming, but we don't want to live with that, we want to live with 1.8, and we can mm-hmm. shield enough sunlight to make that happen, um, that's one kind of calculation. It's another thing if the world's at four and a half or five degrees of warming, and we want to try to live at two degrees. So the gap between where we're going to be and what we generally, as a planet, find acceptable is smaller than it was a few years ago, which means moonshot solutions like geoengineering, I think, have considerably less purchase than they did back then. That's not to say that we won't deploy them. And a lot of the right. advocates are actually talking about it now, not as a permanent solution, but as a sort of a bridge. Like if we can say that we know, but we may not get to net zero by 2060, but we know we're going to get there by 2100. Why don't we just like kind of do this weird thing for 30, 40 years to like allow us to build out our capacity? You're still talking about it as on average. But what I'm saying is because of the unequal distribution of the catastrophic effects. So we talked about Chad earlier, right? So yeah, you're right. Maybe it's two to three degrees centigrade and we mitigate the effects of that in America and we're more prosperous. But in Chad, they may be having really catastrophic and lethal heat waves like they might be having in India. And they may take it, up, like you said, it doesn't require global cooperation. They may take it upon themselves yeah. to look at a solution to their immediate catastrophe which is I'm just going to shoot a bunch of shit up into the atmosphere and hope that it that it cools us in in some way and I find it hard to imagine that that won't that that won't go down. Yeah, I mean it's going to be a test for global governance um, for sure. I would say one thing in particular right. about that scenario is that while geoengineering is really cheap compared to the global energy transition, right. It's not that cheap, which means that for a country not to you know, dump on Chad, but for a country as poor as Chad, it's likelier that, you know, it's a country like India or Saudi Arabia, um, a country that has some more resources, is not among the most poor countries in the world, but is still scheduled to be hit by um, by impacts. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, could stand to benefit from a longer, um, a longer continued burn of fossil fuel resources. Um, right. But, you know, th- these are, um, yeah, these are open geopolitical questions, which we haven't begun to um, tangle with. And I think that's actually pretty, problematic. A lot of climate activists like don't even want to talk about geoengineering because it's like a false solution and we don't know what it would do and we don't know what its impacts would be on crop yields and weather and all the rest of it. Um, oh yeah. I don't think it'll become policy. I think it will become one of those shots that a country that's really suffering or a people that's really suffering take. It's it's one of those like we got to, this is a catastrophe and we've got to do something. It's definitely on the table of possibility, I would say. Um, and the, the scariest thing to me about that is how little we know about what it would do. You know, we have some right. sense of the, the temperature impacts, but, you know, and it may well be, it may well be that the other impacts are, are not so bad and, and worth the bargain, actually. But we know so little that we'd really be flying blind to embark on that experimentation. And we only have one 
as with climate change generally, we've only got one planet to experiment with. So we don't get to we don't get to fuck it up that many times before we, you know, we're really screwed. David Wallace Wells, you have you are a young man, <laughs> younger than I. You have young children and you know so much about this and you've spent so much time uh, delving into that. And yet you remain, I think, uh, a really positive voice for, for moving forward. And I appreciate talking to you all the time because I, as you know, from our conversations, come at it from a slightly darker position. Uh, so I really do appreciate you uh, sharing your insight and your knowledge and, and also your, your realism. Uh, with us because I think that that a dose of, of realism in this is also important. I mean, we're living in the real world. <laughs> it's going to get messy. Yeah. All right. Next time we'll talk about something cheer. We'll, we'll, we'll go sports. We'll do something else. We'll talk about <laughs> something else. It'll be, I mean, my other big beat now is the pandemic. So it's like, I'm really living Jesus, in Jesus, the... David, really? You're on the <laughs> pandemic and climate crisis. Yeah. <laughs> well, these things are important, John. I know, but that's, but, but so is your mental health and your your resilience is also important. <laughs> uh, David Wallace Wells, thank you so much for, for joining us today and for discussing uh, the climate crisis and, and for all your insight throughout this whole process of putting the show together. So thank you very much. No, my pleasure. Great to talk to you. Thanks for having me.